should start with, I should have taken an autograph from Denise when I was on that career panel with her. She is a celebrity. I mean, I'm so impressed. Um, all of you are celebrities, and so if you're on panels together or you have given a keynote here, I think I, going forward, I'm just going to take an autograph just in case and keep it all together. Um, why am I doing the WITS closing speech? I think, as, as Margot already pointed out, I've been associated with WITS right from the beginning. I think except for the janitorial duties, I think <laughs> I've been on the career panel, uh, the mentoring a panel, um, keynote, I've run a workshop, uh, and the most rewarding of all is I've been part of the WIDS high school uh, outreach program. And I'd say that's the one that probably had most of my passion. Oh, I hit the uh, microphone. And I believe the high schoolers, we have two groups of high schoolers sitting out here. Are they still here? Yeah, they are. <laughs> We have a lot of work to do uh, to convince more such high schoolers and uh, middle schoolers to come into the path that all of you have chosen to come into. Uh, and so why is WIDS so important to me? Uh, and I want to start with my own background. I came here in 1992, so I'm dating myself. Uh, I came here to do a PhD in AI. I was an electrical engineer. I had only taken uh, one programming class I hadn't even taken a random variable or a probability class. Um, but I read a book on speech recognition and I did a project on dynamic time warping. At the end of that project, I decided I'm gonna do a PhD in this field. This is the most interesting field that I've seen. I had no idea what was required as a prerequisite to get into the field. Luckily for me, when I landed in uh, Boston University, I landed in a lab that was run by a very, very strong woman scientist an engineer. And that one story, that one role model, was enough to convince me that I belonged, that I belonged in this field, that I belonged at that table. Just imagine if all your stories get out, the 100,000 data scientists that WIDS has been able to reach out to, these stories are what creates that echo chamber, that inclusion <laughs> chamber, where the high schoolers and the middle schoolers feel like when they look around, they see a lot of data scientists around, some in the government, some in the industry, some in academia. They're all looking at plots and graphs and looking at green and red bars. That's how it goes. You know, they don't have to have this doubt in their mind when they enter a physics class and only see two other girls in the class. Or when they get to college and they realize that they haven't done any computer science programming and they're far behind. They aren't. Like my story says, you know, I had very little programming experience, and I'm running a team that does engineering, ML, AI, game theory, auctions. I've learned everything on the job, on the way. So I think these stories are really, really critical that these stories be told, and I think that's what WIDS is creating. And this is why my first action item for all of you is participate. Participate in WIDS, participate in hiring, participate in learning groups, because your story needs to be told. You may think that your story just sounds simple or just like someone else's story, but it resonates. Even if it resonates with one other person, you're creating that path for them. I wanted to take a, a step out from WIDS to what's the next action item I want to give you, because this is a closing of a really, really you know, fantastic day that we have had here today. Uh, and I want to leave you with I do want you to be very ambitious about being a data scientist. So when you come in as a data scientist, you know, you, you're given tools, you're given some Jupyter notebooks, uh, you know your p-values, you know how AV experimentation runs, uh, and you, know, you can actually spend a lot of time just doing that. You can just spend a lot of time running experiments, diagnosing experiments, analyzing things, telling the stories behind those experiments. But I really want you to be a little bit more ambitious about not just the data that you have, but what you can do with that data. And I want to start first with the empathy for that data. And that sounds like an odd thing, but if you're a data scientist, you need to know, I think one of the speakers talked about the genealogy of the data. Where did that data come from? And remember that data is created 
So if the data you're getting is not authentic or it's not real or it's biased, you can actually create, you know, you, you can actually log unbiased data. And in fact, a lot of the machine learning scientists, this is the first thing they need to do. People get really excited about deep learning models and very large scale language models and they look at the hindsight data, but we know that that hindsight data was collected by some system in place. And if you're trying to build a new system, you need to actually randomize the decisions made by the old system. So that data, and having empathy for that data is really critical and figuring out where it came from and what you need to change so that you can make better decisions, that's really critical. The second thing is when people talk about data for good, they will, I mean, Denise is doing data for good. I mean, there's no getting away from it. The, people talk about healthcare. Uh, people talk about these areas where it's very clear that you can see data science is being applied for a good outcome. But many of us are working on products that are being used by thousands and thousands of people. And when it comes to data for good, these products also need to do good for not just the best users of the product, but for the tail users. Let's take online advertising. Definitely doesn't sound like a data for good. <laughs> I work in online advertising. And in online advertising, I build really, really large scale models and bidding agents and automated systems. And when I talk to my really large customers, it's easy for me to realize that these large customers have their own data science team. They're optimizing, they're doing creatives and keywords every day, and they have systems in place that do the best for them. But then I have this long tail of small advertisers who probably have no idea. I mean, they, they just enter a few keywords, they give us a budget, and then they're off and running. Now, can I bring the, the data science capabilities that I'm building, can I bring it to these small advertisers? That is actually data science for good. And in fact, we do it. We, we allow them to experiment. Uh, we use some of the largest language models that you have, you've heard of. I mean, internally, it is Microsoft Turing for us. And we use those to generate creatives uh, and test those creatives on their behalf. We automate bidding agents for them. Uh, so when you look at your product, you don't have to step off and go somewhere into the woods to do data science for good. You can do data science for good with the product that you have, with the customers that are using that product. So that's where I wanted to first start with. That's empathy for the data. And the second thing I wanted to ask you to do is to have ambition. Uh, ambition about the tools you're using, ambition about the infrastructure that you're using, and always push the boundaries of that ambition. I'll start with A-B experimentation. For many of the large organizations that work with lo lots of data, Experimentation was the key breakthrough that we had. We run thousands of experiments. Um, very quickly, as you know, we build the AB experimentation platform, say you have a million, two million sets of users, you're running experiments on them. We quickly realized we ran out of users to run experiments on. The first challenge that we had was, now can I run multiple experiments on the same user? And we figured out how to do that. If you have orthogonal hypotheses, you can run multiple experiments on the same user. So you as a user, Google for instance, or Microsoft is running multiple. They may be running a UX experiment, they may be running a placement experiment, so they may be running different types of experiments on the same user. Now we wanted to push that a little bit more and see, now if you have a lot of correlated hypotheses, do you really need to run discrete time-bound experiments? You know, if you're working in contextual bandits or reinforcement learning, you know that you can weed out hypotheses as you go around. Now, if you can do that, this means the scale of your experimentation just grows. Now, tying these two concepts together, we're trying to do that right now with UX experiments. This is pushing the boundary, pushing the boundary of what the current platform gives you. And I want you to use this type of, uh, I think the first speaker asked, you know, what are the questions that have not been asked? Oh, she's already cutting me off. I, I would say all of you, please ask the questions that have not been asked. Thank you.